Thanks to everybody here for uh, staying through to the end. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, some relationships between integration and logic. Uh, before I do that, I want to give one quick update about Wednesday's uh, talk. Uh, I mentioned work of Christian Sagedy and his group at Google Research. And uh, uh, yesterday, a couple of us took a trip down to Google Research to visit the team. So they, um, they used whole light to, uh, as a data set for machine learning using uh, the libraries there, including the formal proof of the Kepler conjecture. And at uh, meetings I was at a couple of weeks ago in Austria, uh, they uh, gave an updated report on this. And while we were there at Google, uh, Sarah Lose, one of the members of the team, got this uh, uh, email alert that uh, <laughs> New Scientist has just uh, written an article about their research group. Google has created a mass AI that has already proved 1,200 theorems. So this is uh, specifically 1,200 theorems from the whole light proof assistant based on John Harrison's uh, formalization of complex analysis. Uh, so John originally did these by hand, and now Google can do them um, automatically. Uh, so today, I'm going to talk about uh, integration with logic. I'm going to talk about uh, a new type of integration uh, devised by Kinsevich in 1995 called motivic integration. And I'll uh, spend much of my time talking about uh, those developments. And then at the end, I'll give some applications to representation theory and the Langlands program. Um, so uh, much of what I say today is based on work done by uh, Francois Lozère, who's with us today, and his collaborators. Uh, uh, Deneff and Cluckers, and uh, so if, if there are any questions, I'll just uh, <laughs> ask you to talk to the expert. Uh, so uh, this is a theory of integration, but the first thing to know about it is that it's very, very different from the type of integration you learn in calculus courses. And it can take quite a while just to sort of reorient yourself to this new type of integration. So at the beginning of my talk, I'm just going to give you four ways to view this new type of integration. And these different perspectives will all be quite different. And just pick your favorite one of the four. And if you understand one of these perspectives, then already uh, you're doing quite well. Uh, so I'll just start with scissors and congruences. Uh, so this is uh, how I explained motivic integration. I talk I gave in the uh, special session of AMS uh, organized by Dave Eisenbud a number of years ago. But it's just based on uh, scissors and congruence. Okay, so question is, what is the area of a polygon? And uh, Hilbert's third problem asks, uh, well, in three dimensions, but uh, we can ask the same question in two dimensions. If two polygons have the same area, can you cut one into finitely many pieces and reassemble them so it's the other polygon? Uh, so that is the type of area we're thinking about. Don't think about analysis. Don't think about limits. Try to think of area and integration as a very sort of uh, scissors and congruence type thing where we're cutting one thing up into another and reassembling uh, the pieces. And so uh, the answer in two dimensions, of course, is that you can always do this. Uh, first, you just triangulate your polygon, cut it into triangles, and any triangles I've shown can be put into rectangles. And then rectangles can be restacked. And there's this uh, sliding trick that allows you to change uh, the length and width of the rectangle while preserving 
its area. And so by a combination of these moves, you can transform any polygon by finite number of cuts and reassembling to a rectangle of unit width and whose length is exactly equal to the area. Now, uh, Hilbert's third problem was doing this in three dimensions, and this was the first of Hilbert's problems to be solved, and it's impossible in three dimensions. So let's just forget about <laughs> three dimensions. We want to stick to situations where this actually works. Um, and so we can think of the area of a polygon as being represented by the rectangle that gives its area. And so instead of thinking of area as a number, we're going to think of it still quite geometrically as a representative shape for a given uh, region that we're trying to measure. Okay, so that's the first perspective. Um, so what we use here are scissor relations. So we cut things into pieces. And congruence relations, we move pieces about and reassemble. Okay, so that's our first perspective on integration. Uh, so as I said, area of a polygon we think of as uh, its normal form, in this case a rectangle. And we want something that makes the volume obvious to us. Um, and then we like to do things uh, as algorithmically as possible with decision procedures and so forth. OK, second perspective. Let's take a categorical perspective to integration. So we're going to have a bunch of objects. Uh, so we'll have a category with a bunch of objects, x, y, and so forth and morphisms in the category. And then uh, we think of each of these objects as some sort of region in some sort of space. And we're going to have functions on that space. Uh, so these we're going to call constructible motivic functions. Don't be scared by the name. We're just going to construct some ring on these spaces x. And uh, they might not be functions in the literal sense of the word, but uh, for each arrow between uh, these different objects, uh, we're going to have a pullback of functions in the usual uh, way that we can pull back functions. And then we want integration to be thought of as some sort of push forward operation. If I have a morphism in the category from x to y, uh, there should be uh, some sort of integration along the fibers of the map x to y. And so that will be a function then on y, where the value at y is the integral over the fiber. Um, so it should uh, be functorial for compositions. Um, if we have a terminal object in the category, then we should be able to integrate all the way down to a point, if we think of that as a terminal object, and that, that will be what we think of as the integral of a function. And then we'd like many standard results to hold in this context, to things like change of variables, formulas, Fubini, and so forth. OK, so this is not telling us how to actually do any of this. It's just sort of writing down an abstract framework of objects and functions and uh, integration without saying what any of it is. But uh, uh, this theory of motivic integration is going to flesh this out with uh, something that uh, actually falls into this kind of picture. OK, so I'm going to skip over lots of things today because I, uh, I'm not going to have time in the course of one hour uh, to talk about uh, all the technical details of integration. But there are things like, when is a function integrable? Uh, you know, even uh, with ordinary integration and something like Lebesgue integral, uh, you have a Lebesgue integral on the real line, and then on R2, and then on R3. Or you have Hausdorff 
measure of different uh, dimensions. And so there's a dimension theory that needs to go along with integration so that you uh, integrate uh, three-dimensional objects using the three-dimensional Lebesgue and two-dimensional objects using two-dimensional Lebesgue. It's the same here. There's a th theory of dimension that needs to be discussed that I'm just going to skip over. So I'm just going to assume that we pick the appropriate thing. Uh, so a couple of observations about the categorical picture. Uh, when we integrate things over fibers, um, we're going, say, from x to y, and then the result of that integral, that value, might be integral, integrated a second time when we go from y to z. So these rings of functions that we pick need to be big enough to contain the results of all the integrals that we compute. Uh, but if we make it too big, then it becomes uh, hard to actually have uh, decision procedures to do the integrals. And so uh, there's sort of a balancing act of getting this ring just right where we can uh, compute everything but not uh, but still stay inside the rings. Okay, the third perspective on integration is going to be piadic integration. So uh, the, the rational numbers uh, can be completed with respect to various norms. If we use the usual Archimedean norm, we get the real numbers, but if we use uh, more exotic norms, the piatic norms, we get, again, locally compact fields. And whenever we have a locally compact field, uh, we have a good theory of integration. Just in the usual uh, sense of analysis, we have a Haar measure, which is unique up to a scalar factor. And so we can do piatic integration. And the uh, Integration theory that I'm going to talk about today is modeled on piatic integration. Uh, so I was a graduate student under Langlands, and I did lots of piatic integrals as a grad student. So I was just like, uh, these integrals take me right back to uh, what I spent years doing early in my career. Uh, but let's just take something like the absolute value of x to some power integrated over uh, unit disks, uh, x less than or equal to 1. Uh, so the usual thing is uh, first to uh, move one of the powers of the absolute value into the denominator of dx over x. And then we break it up into a discrete sum according to the value of the absolute value of x. And when we do that, uh, this factor becomes a constant that we can pull out of the integral. And then we have a dx over the absolute value of x, just as in the case of the real numbers. Uh, this is scale invariant under change of variables. So uh, the integral part now is independent of the index i. And we can completely separate it into a geometric sum and a factor that's independent of the i. And when we put it all together, uh, we get something that's a rational function of the number p. I've written it in this way with an l, uh, just to emphasize that we, in some sense, we're getting the same answer uh, no matter what the prime p is. We've got this rational function that's independent of the prime, and then at the very end, we're plugging in the number p for l to get the value for that particular field. And so what that's showing is that all of these different integration theories for all of the different prime numbers are somehow related in a uniform way. And motivic integration is designed to somehow get at that uniform behavior of piatic integration as we go from one prime to another. And so lots of formulas like this are going to show up in the motivic integration 
theory, we'll write everything in terms of a parameter L, and then at the very end, we specialize uh, to the given field and get the answer uh, field by field. So the final perspective is uh, quantifier elimination and cell decomposition. Um, so I'll, let's start with the second line here. Uh, Tarski, uh, I mentioned this in my first lecture, gave a procedure for quantifier elimination for real closed fields. And what it means, I've given a specific example here. Uh, we have variables A, B, C, and a bound variable x and we're asking when does a quadratic equation have a root? When does there exist an x such that ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero? Uh, so this is an example of a formula in uh, the Tarski language. We're only using arithmetic here and a quantifier and Tarski's uh, decision procedure tells us that we can always rewrite a formula like this in such a way that the quantifiers go away. Well, we learn in algebra how to do it for this formula. You know that a quadratic equation has a root if and only if the discriminant is non-negative. So that is Tarski's procedure for this particular equation with one quantifier. And what Tarski did is he proved a very general result saying that this can always be done. Uh, you have uh, equations uh, that just involve, uh, I didn't write down the language, but we could allow inequalities, equalities, and uh, the operations of a ring, addition, multiplication, constant zero and one, and then we can always eliminate quantifiers. Uh, so Pressburger, I guess this was, uh, what, 1929, uh, did the same thing for the integers uh, using just the additive theory of the integers. So we allow addition but not multiplication and uh, congruence. I'll come back to this later in my talk. And then Paul Cohen uh, gave uh, generalization that worked both for real and p-adic fields. Uh, this is a very big topic. Uh, I'm going to skip over lots of history here, uh, just giving a few highlights that are relevant for this talk. Um, but a lot of these procedures are based on what are called cell decompositions. Uh, you have a formula with, uh, like this Tarski formula, has variables a, b, and c. Uh, what we're doing um, to do quantifier elimination, we want to know whether there exists a solution to such and such. And you rewrite it in a way that it's a disjoint union of cells, where cells, I'll give an example of cells later in my talk, but cells are things, they're given by very simple equations. And so if you want to know whether there exists a solution, it's almost just obvious by looking at the cell whether there exists a solution or not. So the trick is rewriting everything as a finite disjoint union of cells, and then the answer becomes obvious. Um, so from this fourth viewpoint, the idea of motivic integration is that we start with some sort of region X. We're again going to use cell decomposition, but we're going to repurpose it. So cell decompositions first came up for quantifier elimination, but it describes a set in a very simple way. So if we break it up into cells, and if we can figure out what the volume of a cell is, then we just add the volumes of the cells together to get the volume of all of x. Okay, so we're using cell decompositions from the theory of quantifier elimination, but for a completely different purpose, we want to add up the volumes of the cells. 
Okay, so that's the summary of the four perspectives on motivic integration. Scissors and congruences, category theory, piatic integration, and then finally quantifier elimination using cell decompositions. Okay, so uh, that's just like the overview. So pick your favorite. That for you today is what uh, motivic integration is going to be. Now I'm going to go back into a little more detail on uh, exactly how this is going to work. So the language that we use uh, is called the Deneff Poss language. Uh, so we want to have a theory, like I say, that's modeled on fields like QP. This field has a valuation. Uh, so I was writing the absolute value of x, uh, but that's p to the minus valuation of x. So we think of it as the log of the absolute value. So this goes into z. And then there's another map called the angular component that goes into the residue field. Uh, so the intended interpretations are things like taking a field K and the field of formal Laurent series. So you just take uh, power series with, uh, without worrying about uh, convergence and then taking the field of fractions. Um, <clears throat> so there are three sorts. There are three objects involved in writing down the language. This valued field, which has this valuation, the target of the valuation, and the target of the angular component. The angular component map I've written here, uh, the intended interpretation for uh, a formal power series is just it picking out the leading term of the formal power series, and that's something in the residue field. Um, so then we build up formulas inside this language, and we think of each of these formulas as defining some set x. Um, so the formula was going to have some uh, variables in it. We have three kinds of variables because it's a three-sorted language. And so <clears throat> as I write here, uh, for any field k, and given our formula phi inside this language, build up from arithmetic and valuations and angular components and so forth, we can take the set of solutions of that formula inside that field. Uh, so we get something like this. And this object x that assigns to each field uh, using this formula uh, a set of points is going to be one of the objects in our category. So that's, those are the things that we're integrating over. That's the domain of integration. We think of that as somehow replacing subsets of the real numbers for real integration and so forth. Um, so uh, then arrows, we, we want a category. So we want to say what the objects are, what the arrows are. The arrows, again, are just going to be functions such that their graph is, again, expressible by a formula in this language. So they're defined. So then there's a cell decomposition. There's quantifier elimination for this language. There's a cell decomposition. And uh, uh, in, inside Z, we're just using the additive theory. So this is uh, Pressburger's result from 1929 that we have quantifier elimination here and we can break things up into cells. But we also want to do quantifier elimination here. And uh, that was worked out by Deneff and Poss. And here I've just given a, a couple of examples of what cells might look like. These are the things that are going to be very simple to describe and whose area we should be able to figure out without much difficulty. 
And so uh, we might just take uh, a variable in Z where the variable M is between some integer lower bound and some integer upper bound, and it might have some congruence condition on uh, the X. And so that sort of thing is not hard. So our measure on the integers is just going to be point counting measure. So to integrate over the integers, we just want to count the number of M's between K1 and K2 such that AX, X satisfies the given congruence condition. And then uh, to make it a little more general, we can make everything depend on a parameter U. Uh, so the K1 and K2 can be functions of a parameter U. Um, and then there's a similar thing for the denef pos part, uh, this part up here. Again, we want very simple conditions for ourselves, just things like the valuation of x uh, when we shift by c is equal to some constant, or that the angular component, the leading coefficient of x minus c is equal to some constant. And things like that are going to be our cells. And then the quantifier elimination results say that we can always break things up into cells. So if we can figure out what the volume of something like this is, then we have our candidate volume for our theory of integration. Uh, so how do we write down what the volume of something like this is going to be? Well, you know, going back all the years as a graduate student, you know, I, I computed lots of piadic integrals, and you know what the answer is there. And so you just take the P and replace it by an L, and then you define the volume in this situation just to be the corresponding formula there. And then you've got an abstract theory of integration that's independent of the prime P because we replaced P by L. Okay, so that's, uh, so uh, just in summary then, the volume for the uh, valued field part is going to be based off piatic volumes and our experience of what the values of integrals are there. Uh, the volume on the Pressburger piece on the integers is going to be based on discrete sums over subsets of the integrals, uh, of the integers, just uh, point counting. And then on the residue field, uh, we're not going to care about that. So we're just going to do something tautological. We're going to take, say that the volume of each set x is the symbol x. Uh, where x is going to be in some ring. Uh, so this is a Grotendieck ring, meaning that we've got some scissors and congruence relations going on. If I can break a set as a disjoint union of two pieces, then the volume of the whole thing will be the sum of the uh, volumes of the two pieces. And uh, if we have uh, an isomorphism, then it should uh, have the same area and so forth. So that's the idea of our theory of volume. And then uh, that allows us to take volumes of sets. And then the next step on top of that is to say what the ring of functions should be. And as I said, this is a bit of a balancing act. Uh, you want uh, it to be big enough that it contains the results of all the integrals, uh, things mapping into it but you don't want it too big. So we need, at least need the symbol L because I've shown that certain piatic integrals involve the number L. And that piatic integral that I computed explicitly actually had the inverse of, uh, had one over one minus L to the N. So we're just going to uh, put those things in our ring. Uh, we said that our, Integration over the residue field is going to be fairly symbolic. So we're going to just put symbols in uh, from some Grotendieck ring into our ring. And then we have things like uh, absolute value of x 
Here it's uh, p to the minus valuation, but if we want to write it without a p, we replace by l. And so we want, in particular, things that look like l to some function here that's definable in our, in our language. Uh, and then we'll add in step functions as well. Okay, and then we have a ring, and so then we just add and multiply and look at all the things they generate. And then the <coughs> theory of Klucker and Loza says that there's a good theory of integration uh, using uh, this category of objects defined by formulas with the rings, uh, as I've just sketched. Uh, the integration is completely spelled out by a system of axioms. So you can just, anything you want to compute in this ring, you just follow the rules and it will tell you how to compute any integral that ever comes up. So you, so you don't get, you, you never get stuck uh, in this theory. Uh, and then uh, this was based off the p-adic numbers and there is a specialization map. So if you have a function that's integrable, uh, for large P, there's a specialization map that tells you how to specialize uh, this abstract function in a ring down to an actual function on the piatic field. And the answers that you get by integrating are compatible. Okay, so if you do the integral and specialize, you get the same thing as if you specialize and take the piatic integral. Okay. And then there's a pretty incredible property uh, called the transfer principle. It's a big generalization of Axe, Cochin, Airsoft. It says that for large p, uh, if you have a function that specializes to zero, then that happens if and only if other if the function specializes to zero for other fields with the same residue field. So what, so, so remember, these functions are both things that we integrate and things that we get by integrating, right? So these are results of integration. So this might be some big identity of integrals. Um, and it's saying if that integral is that identity holds in characteristic zero, that exactly that same identity of integrals has to hold in positive characteristic and vice versa. Okay, so it's a very powerful way of taking identities about integrals that have been proved for one field and concluding that the same identities of integrals have to hold for another field. Okay, so just a summary slide. There's a three-sorted language that we call the deneff pos language with intended structures, uh, formal Laurent series, and so forth. We use that to build a category of objects. Each object had a ring attached to it, and uh, this ring was designed with integration in mind, so these are exactly the things that we know how to integrate <laughs> Um, and then there's a good theory of integration for integrable functions in these rings that's based on cell decomposition and quantifier elimination. Um, and then it has remarkable properties. Uh, so this transfer principle, but change of variables, Fubini, all the types of things that you'd like uh, for integration. Okay, so that's... Uh, the end of the first part of my talk, uh, that's just saying that we know how to integrate. And now the rest of my talk is going to be about applications. So why is it a good thing that we have this abstract theory of integration? So maybe I should stop here to see if there are any questions before we move on. Okay.
Partitions, okay, part two. Let's talk about partitions. Uh, so let P sub K I be the number of partitions of the number I into parts of size at most K. So for instance, if a K is equal to two, I is equal to six, then P two of six is equal to four because uh, just using the numbers two and one and requiring the numbers to add up to six, we can take two, 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 or two, two, one, one, or two, one, 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 or one, 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 one. Okay, so those are the partitions of six using the numbers two and one. And then we can encode each partition as a monomial in T1 and T2. So for instance, two, 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 I take the variable T2 and it occurred three times, so I take two, T2 to the third power, and that's the monomial that represents that partition. Or I can take two, two, one, one. One appears two times, and two appears two times, so I have T1 to the second, T2 to the second, and so forth. So each of these uh, partitions becomes a monomial in the variables T1 and T2, okay? So then we can take the generating function for these monomials. Uh, so all the possible partitions then are represented by the sum of T1 to any power I and T2 to any power J, I and J going from zero to infinity. Uh, we can separate that out into a product of two power series and then sum the geometric series to get one over T1 one minus T1, one minus T2. Uh, so what that means is now each T1 is giving uh, a contribution of a one and each T2 is giving a contribution of a two. So if we wanna count the number of partitions, we just substitute T in for T1, T squared in for T2, and then look at the coefficient in the power series expansion of i, uh, t to the i, to get what p2 i is, right? So that's the usual power series. Uh, uh, so this all goes back to Euler, I guess, uh, writing down uh, generating functions for partitions. Uh, so note that the function one over one minus t to the n gives, uh, so I expand that in a power series and then look at the coefficients. All the coefficients are zero except for those that are multiples of n. That's exactly a function in the Pressburger, Pressburger arithmetic because uh, to check that something is Pressburger definable, we wanna know that its graph is definable in Pressburger arithmetic and we have congruence mod n for each n inside our Pressburger language. And so we just need to check whether the number is congruent to zero mod n or not. And so this is a Pressburger definable function. And that is exactly one of the factors in uh, our partition <coughs> function here. Um, and then constructible functions are closed under, it, it, they form a ring, right? We had a ring of functions and, uh, and it's closed under integration as well. So that means we can take sums and products of things and we stay inside our ring. And what that means is that this uh, product here, if I expand that out in a power series, the coefficients of that are again constructible functions. So that means this partition function is a constructible function in the language that we build up uh, in the first half of the talk. Okay, so this is a, a constructible function on the integers. So this is what I write here. P2, Z to Z is a Pressburger constructible function. Uh, and this same type of argument can be used uh, to show that many types of partition functions, including 
Uh, so people in combinatorics, they love to put Qs into their formulas. Uh, so there's usual formulas for things and then Q variants of everything. And these same types of arguments can be used to show that we can create all sorts of partition functions that fall within the scope of this theory of motivic integration developed by uh, Kluckers and Lozano. So, so I guess this argument wouldn't show that the partition I and mean, the function that just counts partitions. Right, so if you take the infinite product, then we're... Uh, but, but is that one in fact not Pressburger constructible? Uh, no, yeah, so we're, we're really just taking rational functions here. Yeah. I agree this argument wouldn't show that that one is... No, I, 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 haven't, I haven't checked, but I, I'd be very surprised. <laughs> uh, so now, okay, so that's one application. We can do partitions inside this theory. Now a second application. Let's take the group of n by n matrices with non-zero determinant. Uh, that forms a group. I have a subgroup of n by n minus 1 by n minus 1 matrices. I can sort of think of one as a subgroup of the other just by putting a 1 here to make uh, n by n, n minus 1 by n minus 1 into an n by n. And uh, the theory of representations tells us that if I have an n tuple of integers that are decreasing, uh, that determines an irreducible representation. So um, homomorphism from the general linear group into another general linear group in such a way that it can't be, uh, it's irreducible, it can't be broken up into block diagonal form in any way. Um, so that's just a part of the theory of representations. Uh, we can do the same thing with uh, n replaced by n minus 1, I'll use a parameter called mu instead of a parameter called lambda. And since this is a subgroup of the larger group, we can take a representation of the larger group and restrict to the subgroup and ask how that breaks up. It'll no longer be irreducible. It'll break up into smaller pieces when we re restrict. And the question is how what is the formula for which representations of the smaller group show up in a given irreducible representation of the larger group? Okay, so that's the question. And you look at the answer. Um, and the answer is always, in this particular situation, the answer is always zero or one. And the answer is one exactly when the uh, two partitions interlace each other. So you have lambda 1 bigger than equal lambda, mu 1 bigger than equal lambda 2 all the way down. Um, and these are inequalities uh, among integers. This is again in the Pressburger language. We have inequality as uh, one of our relations inside the Pressburger. So that means, so here I'm taking a function of two partitions, one on the bigger, for the bigger group, one for the smaller group. Uh, it's taking values either 0 or 1. That again is a Pressburger constructible function. It falls within the scope of motivic integration. And in the representation theory, not just of GLN, but uh, all sorts of classical groups, orthogonal groups, symplectic groups, unitary groups, all sorts of reductive groups. There are many such branching rules. And if you start looking at those formulas, you see that they're always given by constructible functions in the sense of motivic integration. So what's going on here? Uh, so I'll just show an example from uh, branching laws from a standard textbook. And uh, if you look at the index, it's talking about branching laws. Uh, but right here, 8.2.1, partition functions. <laughs> and it turns out that the explanation for why everything is constructible is that these partition functions show up. Uh, so this is just another example. Uh, 
So Costant defined a new kind of partition function related to Lie theory. Uh, here's an example. We have uh, three uh, alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3. This is the sum of alpha 1 and alpha 2. If we want to count the number of ways an integer vector can be written as a sum of this alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3, there's a similar type of partition function that you can write down that describes this counting problem for this kind of partition. And uh, this is a little bit small, but there's a famous formula in uh, representation theory, the vial character formula. If you look at the denominator of that formula, you see that again, it looks like if I replace this L by something like this E by an L, it looks exactly like a partition function. And this gives the explanation for why constructible functions are coming up. So finally, in the last few minutes, I want to talk about our contributions. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Bill Kassaman, Jorge Sele, and uh, myself. Uh, so what we do is we generalize Costant's Q partition functions uh, that come up in representation theory. Uh, we show that they're always constructible functions in the sense of motivic integration. And we show that many of the formulas in representation theory on complex groups can be written in terms of these partition functions. Uh, some of them were known in special cases before. And then we show that many identities in representation theory can be expressed using our new partition functions. Uh, so this, uh, if you don't do representation theory, this might just be a lot of strange words, but uh, new branching rules, weight multiplicity matrices, inverses of those, geometric sataki, inverse geometric sataki, uh, Q twisted vial integration formulas, Plancherel measures, spherical Heck algebras, and so forth. Why does this matter? It means that all of these formulas arising in representation theory are constructible. And this allows us to, verse, to traverse what's called the dual group barrier. So what is that? Uh, so Langland's program is an ambitious program to understand, for instance, uh, the L2 spectral decomposition of a group with values in the Adele's modulo, a discrete subgroup. Uh, G here can be GLN, or a classical group, or one, even one of the exceptional groups. And by the Langlands program, this data for the classifications here should all be in terms of a dual group that he defined, uh, which is a complex, disconnected, reductive group. On the other hand, the Adele's, it's a restricted product of things like the Piatic number. So and it, it's a strange situation. You've got groups over the piatic numbers, but the classification data is over in terms of complex numbers. And well, it, it's, a, it's a barrier because, because to relate two groups G1 and G2 that are piatic, you have to first translate everything into complex Lie theory and then relate things over there. And you can't go directly with everything inside the piatic world. How does the dual group barrier get solved? Well, all of this data now on the complex group is constructible, all this representation theory. And the piatic stuff is also constructible. So everything now lives in the same ring of constructible functions. And we're able then to go across this barrier using constructible functions, which allows us to put both the piatic information and the complex group information into the same big ring. Um, so as an application, uh, so uh, Ngo Bao Cho got the uh, Fields Medal for proving the fundamental lemma, uh, uh, an important identity of integrals uh, that comes up in the Langlands program. 
there's a more general version of that identity that works for any element in a certain algebra of functions on the piadic groups called the Hecke algebra. And uh, we're able to use the transfer principle to move that identity uh, from positive, zero characteristic where it was known to positive characteristic. Thank you very much. function because things like that show up in representation theory of infinite in, in, of infinite dimensional things. Is is there some way of adapting this kind of theory to study that setting or, uh, or you just have to give up? Well I I I would not know how. I, uh... But you don't seem like a guy who gives up. <laughs> So uh, you get uh, measures on formulas. You get all sorts of interesting things, like you can take Euler characteristics of formulas. And but they are not always integers. Not always integers, but you can take Euler characteristics of formulas. So are there dense packings of formulas? <laughs> Well, there's a... so this is my favorite sphere packing in two dimensions. It's also uh, the vectors that are used for the cost and partition functions. <laughs> That's about as close as I can come. <laughs> Multiplic integration, you actually kind of made it sound like geometric in the, in the sense that you thought of L the affine line. So can you really think of this multiplic integration as counting points of some algebraic variety? Yeah. So the, 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 the whole the whole so there's a great deal I wasn't able to say in one hour, but it, it's very geometric. The, the this integrals. Uh, continue to carry lot, lots of, it's not just a real number is the answer or a complex number. It really carries a great deal of geometric information. Is there a like, way to tell like what's the kind of like, hidden geometric objects given say your, your like, integral formula? Well, I mean, there's the procedure, I mean, the procedure is quantifier elimination and, and so forth. Right, you have a formula with quantifiers, quantifier elimination uh, removes quantifiers and gives something looking more like algebraic geometry. Which of these ways of thinking of multiplic integration was most useful for your Heinemann's uh, application? Uh, well, we, in the end, we really used the, um, I guess, the categorical approach with the axioms provided by Cluckers and Lozère. Uh, that, that pretty much gives a, a, a complete description of, of what you need. Well, if not, that brings our, uh, our series to a close. And 
Uh, let's all thank uh, Professor Hales once more for some beautiful and inspiring lectures.